Hey everyone, back again. Today I want to talk about Felix Guattari's essay titled Becoming Woman from this volume, The Hatred of Capitalism, which is the title, which is a pretty fairly inappropriate title given the subject matter of the text itself, but in any case it has some good essays in it. Now before jumping into it, hi I'm David. I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, you can see 300 episodes I already have up. More than that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you want to help me out, do all those things I just mentioned, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows? They might get a kick out of it. Share the stuff. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but no pressure to do that. If you found this in a podcast platform, you're going to be able to find the video of it on YouTube. Or if you found the video for it on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it just as a podcast on a podcast platform if you just prefer to have the audio. And I've been told I have a soothing voice. Maybe you have trouble falling asleep. Maybe this will help you fall asleep. It's boring stuff. It's, you know, it's stimulating, but it can be boring. So in any case, without further ado, let's jump into Felix Guattari's essay titled Becoming Woman. Now, for those of you that don't know, Felix Guattari wrote alongside uh, Gilles Deleuze. They wrote together texts like A Thousand Plateaus and Anti-Oedipus, both of which I've covered on this channel if you want to go and see or listen to my expositions into those texts, which are long and I hope fruitful, but in any case, you can go check that out if you want. But here we have Guattari on his own talking about both becoming and what the status of marginalized figures in the world is for him, his project, and certainly it is applicable to Deleuze as well, and them together. So he starts out this essay by suggesting, or bifurcating, bifurcating, dividing homosexuality into three camps. Now, what I do also want to say is that I'm going to take some problems with what Guattari says here, but that's par for the course. I mean, we have to criticize our idols. If we don't, then we're just, we're pretty much just in a cult. So there are lots of problems with this, and I'm going to lay them out toward the end. But in any case, I'm going to present what we have here. So he divides homosexuality into three broad camps. The first one that he gives us is essentially homonormativity. He describes a situation in which gay people, mostly gay men, are forced to adopt the dominant ways of living in the world, buying a big house, uh, attaining corporate jobs, maintaining company with other privileged people, upholding so many negative or oppressive institutions. Now, the issue here for Guattari is that these people are not just like living good lives. I mean, they're still going to be subject to discrimination. They're still going to be subject to a medical apparatus that pathologizes them. And they're expected to just live through that, to still manage to live their lives in that, which is obviously difficult to do. Now, the second camp or the second group that he defines or that he points to are those gay people who actively oppose the system at hand. They oppose the very ordering of the system at hand and try to thwart it. So they do this by undoing phallocentrism, by calling attention to heteronormativity, by opposing the other institutions that are so tightly wound with heteropatriarchal norms. And he says that it is in this camp that they could, there can be some alliances between homosexuals and feminists. Now, some of the language that he uses, I'm not going to use because it's outdated, but in any case, this is what he gives us. Now, he suggests that these first two camps are not very radical in their approaches to actually identifying and opposing the underlying logics that subtend, that exist underneath our current world, and that benefit dominant class, dominant race, and dominant sex, including others. So he suggests that there is a third category of homosexuality that actually does more. It is a more radical project, and he suggests that it is molecular. So it is molecular insofar as it is going to strike at these subterranean structures and ideas that bind the system together. So it does this first and foremost by repudiating all of the categories upon which the first and second camps are founded. Even in the second camp that pose a radical alternative to, or an alternative to, dominant heteropatriarchal norms, it still maintains strong divisions between heterosexuality and homosexuality, between men and women, between 
any other groups. Whereas the third camp breaks down all of these identity categories altogether in order to open up more possibilities of change, of development, to make more opportunities available to us. Now, part of its project within this third camp is to identify the molecular connections between various groups that are designated as deviant, designated as or rendered subjugated within this world, including criminals, including gender minorities, including racial minorities, um, people who are suffering from mental illness, people who might be homeless, and so on. People who largely criminalized, institutionalized within our world. Now, all of these people are united by the very fact that they are rendered this subjugated status. They become subjugated, and this is what unites them, even though the very substance of their subjugation is going to vary between groups. The way that people suffering from addiction, for example, are going to be treated very differently than people who are criminals in who commit active violent acts of crime, for example. Yet what unites them for Gutari and what he finds interesting is their very status of as being minority figures within this world, and they're being subjugated as a result of it. Now, insofar as they are subjugated, and we are finding a uni uniting thread between them, he points to what he believes to be the broadest category of subjugation, and that is for him in our heteropatriarchal world, is the feminine, our women, who have been historically subjugated for so long, and the, the roots of the subjugation extend very deep in our world. So he suggests that, or he uses this image, this illustration of the woman, of the feminine, as a way to identify and to highlight this common unity as being an oppression that extends from an initial repression of women. Now, he doesn't exactly suggest that women were the first people to be marginalized. He's instead just focused on it because they are such a broad category. It just affects so many people on a global scale. Now, anyone that belongs to the subjugated status, they are people who have undergone some kind of change. That is, they have deviated from a very powerful normative apparatus, one that tries to mold and shape people into a specific way. And this happens through schooling, through, uh, through religion, through socialization, through all of these different institutions. People who have not adopted the normative standard have undergone a kind of change. They've mutated. And they have, by virtue of that, in their words, that is in Guattari's words, have became something else. They have undergone a becoming. Now, because he uses this term, the feminine, or the illustration of the feminine in order to illustrate this idea of the feminine, to illustrate all of these marginalized people and to unite them, he suggests that they have undergone a becoming woman. They have became this figure who has been and continues to be historically oppressed within our world. Now, he goes so far as to suggest that all libido, all sexual energy is driven towards change. It pushes itself and pushes people to embrace things that are new. And so therefore, it is always part and parcel with a kind of becoming, a constant changing, a mutating into what is new. Now, when he's describing womanhood here, and he's describing the act of becoming woman, he's not actually referring to the domestic image of women as they've been subjugated and forced to work in the home, largely. He is instead using more abstract, or thinking of it more abstractly, as of the, the broadest category of people who have been oppressed on a massive scale. So he doesn't want to territorialize, he doesn't want to ground this idea with a concrete example of like a specific woman or with specific female roles because they are very coded, they're regimented and would then limit possible change. So becoming woman for him is not just the act of then taking up uh, domestic labor, for example, that would be to reinscribe the very logics of exclusion and oppression and exploitation that this world rests upon. But the category itself is nevertheless useful because it is still intelligible insofar as women, as a category of people who are and have been very much oppressed, still belong to the broader matrix of uh, possible comprehension within our world. That is, you think of the of what it means to be a woman and the subjugation of women, likely you're going to have an idea about what that means. 
So he uses it as a stepping stone into other possibilities. So becoming woman is something of a template or a stepping stone is really the best way to put it into other possible avenues of ad adaptation and development. So it might be a way by which someone might become animal or become cosmos, become color, become saxophone, become anything. And this implies that people are undergoing a change from an oppressive norm that seeks to code and regiment, map and control people by becoming something new, becoming something other than that. So he's really strict about this. He's not trying to push essentialism to say that there's something just innate about women that he is drawing upon here to make sense of this process. He's instead trying to point to the ways in which there's always a degree of deviance insofar as deviance is a constructed category used to describe people who have moved away from a culturally constructed norm. Deviance is what unites these different people. So he suggests that part of the task is to find what is common among all of them in terms of their being deviant that can open up this possibility. So in the case of homosexuality, he suggests that the task is not to just clump all gay people together and say like, okay, that's where the site of possibility is. Instead, he suggests that because we have this idea about what deviancy is in accordance with our world, we can then apply it to understand the very elements of deviance within the dominant class, or in the case of sexuality among heterosexual people, where we can see all of these demonstrations of homosexual acts that are, I guess, sublimated into acceptable forms of conduct between men, like sports people, uh, like male athletes who undergo very sexualized interactions with one another, but because it happens in a certain arena, it is then evacuated of all of that meaning. So Guattari's task or his hope is to find out the ways in which we are all geared towards a possibility of something new, but that these possibilities are consistently stifled by these normative institutions and assumptions. So his goal is to open up these possibilities. And he concludes his essay by thinking about sex workers and the way that sex workers are discriminated against, how they are policed and institutionalized, and, you know, incarcerated, to say that instead the task should be to subsidize sex work uh, from the government in order to open up that possibility of possible, what he calls the micropolitics of desire, opening up the possibility for new kinds of interactions to occur, or to at least illustrate, instead of constantly hiding these interactions to illustrate the extent to which that within that arena there is the intersection of patriarchal authority with capitalist authority with uh, you know the subjugation of women and how all these things connect which we wouldn't be able to do if we just relegated it to the shadows and didn't think about it yeah so as far as and this is a broader issue i have with Deleuze and Guattari even though i'm indebted to them and love their stuff is that they treat subjugation as though it's just a mask that people could put take on put on or take off so they treat womanhood which is a very much a, a subjugated status as a site of possibility for people who are in lots of ways already privileged so Spivak's criticism of Deleuze and Guattari essentially says the same thing where she says that isn't it a privilege to be able to just become something else not everyone has this possibility in fact the desire to really reflects a certain kind of of person existing in a certain kind of world, largely a capitalist one, where Gayatri Spivak, among others, and this is something that I certainly hold uh, to be a, a very strong criticism of Deleuze and Guattari's work, in that they are describing processes that very much mirror the logics of late capitalism, where capitalism sees no barriers. It just wants to do what it wants, go where it wants, take on any kind of appearance it wants in order to benefit itself which very much resembles this process of becoming. Now, I temper my criticism with the acknowledgement that their work is much more radical in that they also identify the ways in which capitalism rests upon, depends upon very strict structural codes in order to keep itself afloat and that it isn't a completely decentralized system of possibility. It is still very strict, whereas Deleuze and Guattari are trying to emancipate themselves even beyond that. But in any case, I think it's important to 
be wary of those instances in which subjugated people are used as a template or used as opportunities for you know, objectively privileged people in our world, largely white European men, who can just do what they want, take on any appearance that they want in order to proffer themselves up to allow for their own development and their own possibilities. And again, I say this with the utmost respect, but you have to be prepared to criticize your idols or else you're just falling into a cult. And yeah, that being said, if there's anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. If you disagree with me, I'd love to hear about it. If you agree with me, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, on that note, take care.